hello everyone and thank you for tuning in to our podcast for December. We're going to be touching on a topic of drunk driving. Um, This is something that I feel is very important and that the word needs to get out and everybody needs to be educated on the dangers of drunk driving and the risks that come with getting behind the wheel intoxicated. I have two wonderful guests here with me today. I'm so excited to have them. We were talking before we filmed and they're just really awesome people. I'm so, so happy to have y'all here. We have Trooper Reginald King and we have Trooper Justin O'Neill. They are veterans in this game. I told them I was gonna call them that because they have been doing this, Trooper King for 21 years and Trooper O'Neill for 14 years. And that's a very long time to put in the time and dedication to serving your community. And I'm so excited that they, um, and happy and just thankful that they have put their lives on the line daily for all those years to serve us and to be a part of something like this today. So um, just a little bit about you guys. I'll start with you, Um, Trooper O'Neill. How long have you been with law enforcement? Uh, Been with the state troopers now for 14 years. Um, really love what I do. I started out, you know, of course, in patrol. Me and Trooper King, we were both assigned to Tuscaloosa County when we first got uh, got out of the academy. We were classmates together. Uh, we we've got a special bond, I say, between me and him. Uh, now we about three years ago, I transferred to Birmingham, and as about two years ago, I was assigned to be the. Uh, public affairs officer slash recruiting coordinator for Troop G, which covers Birmingham and Jacksonville Post. So I got pretty much from Jefferson County all the way to the Georgia line is my coverage area. So I got a big coverage area, but things like this is what we do. We want to get the get the word out, try to educate people on, on things that they're supposed to do and not to do. Awesome. Awesome. Thank you for that. Yes. So about you, Trooper King? All right. Well, uh, I'm Reginald King, and I serve the capacity of Trooper Senior with the Alabama Law Enforcement Agency. This is my 14th year as a trooper. Um, this is my 21st year um, serving the state of Alabama. Um, prior to donning this u- uniform, I wore another state uniform, which was for the Alabama Department of Corrections. Oh, great. Yes. Uh, I am also, just like Trooper O'Neill, I'm the Public Affairs Officer and the Recruiting Coordinator for Troop C, and Troop C encompasses the following counties. Tuscaloosa, Bia, Pickens Green, Sumter, Dallas, Perry, Marengo, Hill, and Wilcox. So uh, Troop C covers the Tuscaloosa Post and the Selma Post. Oh, wow. Awesome. So y'all are two very busy men. Y'all are out here doing a lot and serving yes. a lot of areas. We do have a large coverage area. Yeah, yes. that's really awesome. How does that feel to just like, you know, know y'all have so much? Like, Sometimes it can be overwhelming, but at the end of the day, I know that no matter how many hours that I put in, my number one goal is to accomplish the job mm-hmm. and get it done. And I know that at the end of the day, that hopefully if I can save one person's life, then I've done my job. Awesome, that's a great way to look at it. Absolutely. Awesome. So what are um, some of your duties and responsibilities that you you know cover every day? Well, a lot of it is you know, public affairs wise, it's things like this, um, mm-hmm. just getting information out to the public, getting information out to the media, going around and speaking to schools, businesses, different things on, on what we do and how to be safe. And eventually, like I said, our number one goal is at the end of the day is to save lives. Mm-hmm. Absolutely, the trooper's primary function uh, in general is to reduce the number of crashes, preventing crashes by all means necessary, um, and saving lives. Just changing the driving behaviors for the betterment to keep it to keep the citizens and just motors in general safe while utilizing while they're utilizing the Alabama roadways. Mm-hmm. Awesome, and y'all do a great job with that but unfortunately we still have you know not all crashes are preventable um and some are um like in some cases when people drive while intoxicated um that is a huge no-no as you know in all 50 states it is illegal to drive while under the influence um i know me myself i tell people 
I don't drive, even if you've had one or two, you just never know what could happen. You could just, you know, have one or two and then feel comfortable to get on the road and end up involved in a crash. That could either be, you know, the fault of someone else or your fault. Just don't do it. It's really, to me, it's really that simple. Um, just if you go out with friends, you know, I'm not discouraging not, you know, not to not go out or do anything at all, but make sure you have someone there that can be responsible and drive you. That hasn't had anything to drink. Um, I know when I was in college, you know, when I became of drinking age, you know, me and my friends, we would go out, but we would always have one person that was there, you know, to drive us that hadn't drank at all, that hadn't, you know, did anything that was there to make sure we got home safely. Now these days you have Uber, you have Lyft, you have all kinds of driving companies as well that can take you to where you need to go and get you to your destination safely, so utilize that. Um, so I know you guys, y'all see a lot of accidents all the time. Um, how often do you see accidents that involve people being intoxicated? Well, uh, statewide, in, from this time last year to now, there were 2,000 crashes statewide that involved uh, driving under the influence. Mm. Uh, if, uh, you know, like I said, the number one goal is to pre prevent these crashes from occurring. And you're right, if you, we don't discourage anybody not to have a good time, we want everybody to to have a good time, but be responsible. Make sure you got a designated driver. Mm -hmm. It's uh, if you're sitting there, you're questioning yourself to think, "Hey, I think I'm okay to drive." You're probably not. Yeah. You know, make sure you've got somebody responsible enough that is not going to to drink anything, um, and, and make sure everybody gets home safely. Absolutely, absolutely. That is correct. Not just a designated driver. Make sure that you have a sober designated driver. Absolutely. Contrary to beliefs there is a difference between a designated driver and a sober designated driver. Mm -hmm. I never thought about there being a yeah. difference. Yeah. 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 Awesome. So, I mean, is can, can you elaborate on that? Just a little Absolutely. Bit? Yeah. Uh, hypothetically speaking, we're out, um, we're out enjoying festivities and if the festivities included alcohol, um, I would say, hey, Trooper O'Neill, um, you're going to be the designated so you're going to be the designated sober driver meaning trooper o'neill at no point during that time will will consume any alcoholic beverages mm. none zero he's going to be the, the designated sober driver awesome yeah okay. yeah so that's why I, yeah that's a very good point make sure whoever is driving you has no drinks that's a oh i love that you made that point that's very awesome and i never thought about you know that there was a difference because you could tell someone hey be the one to drive us home but they could you know maybe have one or two and be like okay i, I feel fine to drive everyone else home and you know like and like you said just because you've had one or two you know you may not be fine to drive so yes you guys that's so important we cannot stress that en enough so these these accidents that you guys see, um, what are some of the circumstances that surround these accidents? Like, was the driver drunk and injured themselves, or someone else? Were all was everyone in the car intoxicated? Um, well, um, in terms of impaired driving, well, let's let's back up a little bit. Just traffic crashes in general. Um, one that sticks sticks with me was my very first traffic fatality. Um, I remember just as if it was yesterday. The, the, the motorist that was killed was a 15 year old male. And at that particular time, my youngest brother was 15 years of age. So it really hit home. I immediately went home and I called my mother. And I said, mom, if you don't mind, um, if you don't mind, would you run back to Jamel's room, which is my baby brother, and just make sure he's there. And she said, why, what's wrong? And I said, mom, if you don't mind, just, please go back and I'd like for you to put hands and eyes on Jamel, just make sure he's okay. So she did, she came back to the phone and um, she said, he's in his bed, what's wrong? And I said, well, mom, I just had my first, I just investigated my first fatality. She said, what do you mean? I said, I, I worked a crash and it involved um, an individual that was killed and he was 15 years of age. So it really hit home, it, it, it really resonated with me. Hey, this could have been 
my brother, my family member, mm -hmm. that was tragically killed in this in this crash. And all fatalities, they're all different, but it, it it's really different when the death um, when it's the death of a child or a minor. It, it's mm -hmm. it's it's tough. It's really tough. Yeah. yeah. That is. Oh man, that just. I, that made me hurt because I could only, I have younger cousins and I wouldn't know what to do if someone called me and said, you know, your cousin Cassidy passed away because they were hit by a drunk driver or, you know what I'm saying? That, yeah. that would, that would, I feel like it would hurt my soul, but it would also enrage me a little bit because I'd be like, why couldn't you just not drink and drive? Like, what's so... I know on the outside looking, it just seems so simple, just don't drink and drive, but why couldn't you just follow the rules? Yeah. If you just follow the rules, this this could have possibly been avoided. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? It, it, I just feel like it's really that simple. And, and also something that a lot of people don't even think about is um, driving under the influence, it doesn't always mean alcohol. Mm -hmm. You can be driving under the influence of uh, drugs, you can be driving under the influence of prescription medication, if you got a prescribed medication on the side of the bottle that says don't operate heavy machinery, that probably means don't get behind the wheel of a vehicle while you're on that medication. Even things over the counter such as uh, NyQuil that makes you drowsy, I mean, that, things like that can, can get you a driving under the influence uh, arrest also. Mm -hmm. You know, it's not just alcohol, it's things that impair your driving that could cause you to get hurt or killed out here. Yeah. That's correct. Yeah, and I like the fact that you hit on the use of uh, prescription drugs because I um, I recently just you know had a child and during my recovery I was prescribed a medication on the bottle it does say do not you know operate any heavy machinery mm -hmm. and I, I'm thankful that I had a, a, a husband of sound in mind because he was like you're not driving you're not doing anything if you've taken that medicine oh no yeah. you're gonna stay right here in the house and that's just gonna be that um, so I do, I, I'm glad you touched on that point of that it could really be if you're under the influence of anything um, that could cause, you know, for you to be impaired while driving. Yeah. And here at the Agency for Substance Abuse Prevention, we do focus on um, opioid prevention and getting the message out there of the dangers of prescription drug misuse. It is very common, a lot of people, um, are under the influence of these prescription medications, and even though they're prescribed by your doctor, does not always mean that they're handled or you know you handle them in a safe way. Um, so just make sure you follow the instructions that are on your prescription medications. If it says to you know to do something, you know take it the way the doctor told you to take it for one, and then for two, follow the directions. If it says to not operate any heavy machinery, drive, do anything like that. Just simply just follow the instructions, you know, it's it's really that you can be saving your own life or someone else's life by just following the rules. It's yeah. really that simple. Absolutely. So um, when you see these drunk driving accidents, is it always ending in fatality or what are some of, you know, I know we, a lot of them do, mm -hmm. but what other outcomes do you see? Like maybe the persons that are okay and they get arrested or... Yeah, uh, you know, worst case scenario, we, we definitely don't want to see anybody hurt or killed out here. Mm -hmm. You know, even if they are uh, driving under the influence, but if you're driving under the influence um, and we're investigating a crash where you were driving under the influence or you get pulled over for driving under the influence, uh, you can go ahead and expect to be arrested and placed in jail. Um, and then you'll have to come to court on a later date and go before the judge and explain to him why you were driving under the influence. It can be very costly. Um, it can it can hurt your uh, hurt your record. You know it'll be on your driving history, arrest record, and even something as simple as that could prevent you from getting a job in the future. Um, anything like that, you know. So it's not just it's not just you. It could be affecting you, and it could be affecting your family if you were arrested for driving under the influence. That's correct. Uh, there's another way to look at it. I've always said the lucky ones are the ones that get caught. Why so? Because they live another day to be better. Does that make sense? Yeah. Yep, the lucky ones are the ones that get caught. Um, chances are if the individual is 
a habitual, if he's an, a habitual offender, one of those individuals that drink and drive or drive impaired on a day-to-day -day basis, he or she's going to feel as if they can get away with it. This is what I do, I'm perfectly fine. I know I can safely um, maneuver a vehicle while I'm under, under the influence of this prescription med or this alcohol. So the, the chances of them getting out there on the roadway um, day after day are going to increase. They're gonna be in their comfort zone, but once they're caught, they're arrested, there's, there's fines, there's penalties associated with that, they're least likely to continue that behavior. Mm -hmm. So they're the lucky ones. Yeah. The ones that aren't so lucky are the ones that end up um, fatally injured or they, they end up getting involved in a traffic crash where innocent people lose their lives. Those are the ones that aren't so lucky. Yeah. That's really, really sad to think about, but it is. And if, you, if you're watching this video and you've ever been involved in a situation like that and you have been arrested for, or you do drink and drive habitually and you just haven't gotten caught yet, you please take this time to just reevaluate your circumstances, reevaluate that you have another day to, to change that. You don't have to continue to do what you're doing. Just think about it before you get in that car because the next time you get in that car, it could cost you your life. It could cost the life of someone else um, that's completely innocent and had nothing to do with what you were doing prior to getting in that car. Um, so I, I I'm really pre appreciate you saying that. That was a very good point. So how often do you um, see underage drinkers because I know we're involved in the schools we have our programs where we go and we educate um, you know youth and a lot of them are drinking even though they're not even old enough right. to drink I'm like you guys are you just hit puberty what are you why are you consuming this alcohol and you are still having bodily changes and stuff going on um, how often do you deal with underage drinkers, like high schoolers and stuff? It's, you know, it's it's gonna it's gonna happen any, anywhere that you go. You're gonna run across people that are under 21 years of age. Even even if you're under 21, somebody that say graduated high school, if they're between 18 and, and 21, you know, especially on a college campus, mm -hmm. you're gonna run across that a lot. And a lot of people don't realize is if you're under 21, the uh, the alcohol level is a 0.02, not a 0.08. Mm -hmm. So a 0.02 will put you over the under the influence of alcohol and land you in jail, mm -hmm. um, as opposed to a 0.08. It's just going back to the first thing we said. Always have a designated driver, even a 0.02. It's not. It's not just the the level of alcohol. It's not a 0.02 or a 0.08. If I can de determine that you're un unable to operate a motor vehicle, it doesn't matter what your point about uh, blood alcohol level is. I can arrest you if I figure that you're uh, unable to operate that vehicle safely. Mm -hmm. Triple King? Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, you're spot on. You're spot on. That's, that's, that is accurate. Yes, and I agree. Um, I totally agree with them being arrested even because if you're a danger mm -hmm. to someone else, then you do need to be apprehended to, you know, not only have that penalty there to, to get you straight, but to also get you off the street because you know, you're endangering other people and you don't need to be on the street if you're going to be consuming alcohol or actually anything and being under the influence while driving. So do you have any advice or stories that you guys um, want to give that could help someone watching this video? Because I feel like someone is going to watch this and you know they're they're looking if you know if you if you found yourself here today you're looking for information um and so we need this to be informative and impactful and you guys need to hear this so i remember like it was yesterday it was i got the call and i was about two miles away from where the crash happened it was a little dirt road and I knew I was gonna be the first one there. I knew that I was gonna be there before uh, the deputies arrived. I was gonna be there before the ambulance arrived. So I was trying to get to this crash. And I remember it was a, a dirt road, a very curvy dirt road. There was 
six occupants in a small SUV. There was two young boys in the back seat along with their um, father in the front seat. The mother was sitting in the passenger seat and the mother's best friend was sitting in the driver's seat. Well, the mother had the five-year-old daughter sitting in the best friend's lap, steering the wheel, going down this dirt road, and they were probably in excess of uh, 60 miles an hour on a 35 mile an hour dirt road. Oh my goodness. And uh, the five-year-old little girl was sitting in the, the best friend's, the mother's best friend's lap, steering the vehicle. The vehicle went up the embankment, flipped over, and the little girl was ejected from the vehicle. I knew when I got there that I was trying everything I could, but I pretty much knew that that uh, she was gone at the time. And come to find out that the driver was under the influence of methamphetamine, and they were actually headed to get more methamphetamine. And from that point on, just just the the, the rage that I had that this little girl lost her life because of dumb decision made by not only the driver but by the parents allowing that little girl to do that too and like I said that that's been in the back of my mind and stuff like that should not ever happen the story you just gave oh my gosh yeah. I couldn't I couldn't imagine and that's why I I know I made the personal decision um, a long time ago that I don't know. I, I don't drive under the influence of anything. If I go out and I decide to have a drink with my friend or my husband or something, I'm not driving and I'm not letting anyone that's under the influence of anything drive me. That is my rule. Nope. And with me having a child now, this is why. And my husband's always kind of like, you're, you're mama cub, you're overprotective. And I'm like, no, like I have to, if I don't trust you for one, you're not going to be around my child. But the people that I do trust, I, I have to observe you. I have to make sure you're making, you know, decisions, sound decisions. That's, you know what I'm good. saying? That you're not going to be out. If you have my child in the car drinking and driving, that you're going to drive safely, for one. Right. That you're going to make sure that she's put in her seat safely. That she is buckled up safely. Mm -hmm. That everyone in the car is taken care of. Or wherever you guys are, are just, she's taken care of. Because I could not, just thinking about it. I could almost cry because I just wouldn't, I would literally lose everything if I lost my baby to something as senseless as that. And, and I'll tell you that something, one of my biggest pet peeves is seeing adults that do not restrain their children in the vehicle. Mm -hmm. they, they'll have a car seat in the back seat, the car seat's not buckled in, and the baby is just sitting there in the car seat unbuckled. That car seat's not going to do you any good if you're in a crash. Yep. So that's one of my pet peeves. If I stop you and you don't have uh, a child restrained, I promise you I'm going to issue a violation after I make sure that that child's restrained properly. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Yep. And my, my husband, and when he installed the first car seat we had, I actually went to the fire department yeah. and had them help me because I, was, I didn't know what I was doing. Mm -hmm. And I was like, I want some people that know what they're doing, that's right. certified in this. To help me out and then the second one that we put in my husband did a lot of research watched a lot of videos before he put it in and made sure he not only has it like latched there's like two latch things but he got the seat belt on well, that's, that's, you can go to, he's like you got everything to so make you sure went to a fire department you can you can pretty much go to any fire department any police department state trooper office and they will make sure that you you are instructed on how to properly install that that child seat mm -hmm. yeah. Absolutely, and I was driving behind an SUV the other day. They pulled off into a parking lot shortly after I saw them, but I was there was a, a child in the back seat, and you could tell he was standing up. Yes. And I got so upset because I'm like, "What are you? What are you doing? Why are you allowing this?" And I'm hoping that that person pulled over to get that child straightened out, but you could tell, and the child was just all over the back seat, like moving from one end to the other. And I'm like, if someone, even though y'all are pulling into this parking lot, someone could come out of nowhere and just crash into y'all, then what? You know what I'm saying? Just just be just be mindful of that. And I, I'm glad we were able to touch on that because just it's prevention, you guys. Prevention. There's a lot of things you can do to prevent these situations. Not everything, 
But if you can take steps to prevent something from happening, take those steps. It's it take a few extra minutes. You know what I'm saying? It's not gonna hurt anyone. You know? Do you have any stories you'd like to tell? I'm sorry, I'll get off my stuff. No, it's okay. <laughs> I promise you, it's perfectly fine. Well, there is one life experience that comes to mind, and um, at the majority of the speaking uh, events that I attend, I share this. I share this experience uh, because it was really life changing for me. It was early in my career. Um, I won't say the specifics such as the county or the um, the names out of respect for the family, but this was a quadruple fatality. Meaning that once I arrived, there were four people that were um, that were killed. Okay. Mm -hmm. All right, so I'm a young trooper, and as I arrive, um, there's not a vehicle there, or at least I, there's, there's not a vehicle visible. The volunteer firefighters are standing around, and I ask, where's the vehicle? And they say, it's, it's down off in the wood line. So I get my camera, I strap it around my neck, and as I'm walking down the hill, it's dark, as I'm walking down the hill, I stumble, I almost trip. Um, there's a body, it's the body of a female. So I step back, I take pictures, the firefighters ask, Trooper King, what do you want me to do? What can I do to help? Um, well, let's, let's get a bag, get her in the bag, and get her out of here. As I continue to walk toward the vehicle, um, walk down the hill, I eventually come upon the vehicle. And the vehicle's a white Chevy pickup truck. I remember just as if it happened yesterday. Um, the vehicle, the truck, no longer has a covering over the cab. The cab is, the top of the cab is completely gone. It looks as if it's a convertible. As I get there, I see a male, which is which was later discovered um, or identified as Dad. Dad's hovering over the, the front um, dashboard just like such, and he's shirtless. I get my camera, I take my pictures. Firefighters ask Trooper King, what can we do to help? I said, um, let's get him out of here, get him in a bag, get him up the hillside. As they reach down to pull Dad back, um, I see two young daughters, okay? I remember the garments that they wore just like it was yesterday. I take my pictures. Um, we get them properly taken care of. We clear the scene, and I just witnessed four, four people killed four people killed and the it was later revealed that um, that crash occurred because the driver chose to drink and drive okay it doesn't stop there I'm on the scene and I have witnessed four people be killed but it didn't stop there because those young daughters those those two young girls they had a mother that was alive and well so it was my duty as a trooper to locate their mother and to do what I consider is the hardest part, the most difficult part of a trooper's job, in my opinion, and that's the, the death notification. So here I am in the early hours um, of the morning, knocking on the door, locating the mother, asking if I could come in, um, making sure that she's not home alone. She's gonna have proper care because I am about to deliver the message that no parent ever wants to hear. I am about to inform that young lady that her daughters were killed in a traffic crash. And of course she had questions that, such as did they suffer, what caused the traffic crash, things of that nature. So, um, you know, it's tough. That is the toughest part of being a trooper in my opinion. That's the absolute toughest part. Yeah, and I couldn't imagine having yeah. to relay that to someone that just broke my heart I'm sorry mm -hmm. let me get it together real quick so I don't know that just really hurt me you're so strong for being able to do that because I know that's not the first time you had you know you have to do that you have to do that probably uh, unfortunately a lot and that it takes a strong person to relay that message but I know you carry a lot of grief yeah. too from having to be the the messenger. You know what I'm saying for that. That's a that's really yeah. yeah. 
I don't even, I'm, I'm kind of at a loss for words. I'm normally not at a loss for words, but. You know, we, we don't like being the bearer of bad news, but unfortunately that, that comes with, um, that comes with wearing this uniform, that comes with um, being a public servant in law enforcement. Mm -hmm. Yes. And um, I'm, I really, <clears throat> let me get it here, I'm sorry. I really do appreciate you guys coming on and sharing these stories and I'm hoping that whoever watches this, just please, you guys, like, I can't stress this enough. Just don't do it. Just don't do it. Don't just do it. don't do it. If you ever find your situation, if you ever find yourself in a situation where you're needing a ride home, or if you smell intoxicants that are commonly associated to those of alcoholic beverages emitting from the driver's mouth, listen closely. Do not get in that vehicle. Pick up the phone, call your parents, call someone, call an Uber, uh, some type of drive, uh, drive lift program. Sh share, what do you call it? Share, share lift? Right. Share lift. Yeah. Some type of share lift program and um, just make sure that you get home safe, okay? You can always dial 911. You can call your local trooper's office and say, hey, listen, I was watching a podcast with um, Trooper Trooper King and Trooper O'Neill, and they said it was perfectly fine if I found myself in a situation where I needed a ride or I needed help. I could call the um, Aaliyah Trooper's office. Can you please give me some help? Okay, I promise you that will be perfectly fine because we're in the business of saving lives. Okay, we want to prevent crashes by all means necessary. We want to save lives, and we want to continue to put forth an effort to create. Uh, create a climate that's conducive to safe travels for everyone. So just please take a few moments, do the right thing. Don't drink and drive. Never operate a vehicle while you're under while you're under the influence of alcohol and or any type of drugs. Uh, it's for your own. It's for your own benefit. And it's also just want you guys to know that it's very selfish. If you choose to operate a motor vehicle while impaired, it is selfish. Don't 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 be that selfish individual. It involves more than just you. You have loved ones, you have family members, you have friends that care about you out there. We care about you out there. I mean, we, we care about everyone out there in the viewing audience and we just want you to be safe. Yeah. Yeah. If, you know, listen to this podcast and not only the things that, that them or their families would have to go through, but it's tough on us too to do to do this job. And if like Trooper King said, doing a death notification, that can that can wear you down pretty hard, and that can hurt your hurt your heart, hurt you mentally. And just think about it. Next time you see a trooper out there, you know whether we're writing a ticket or taking somebody to jail, you know it's it's always for a reason. And if we end up catching you drinking and driving, we're not going to be your route. We're not going to be your taxi. Mm -hmm. We're going to take you to jail. Absolutely. Because if that can prevent or crash or to save yourself or somebody else's life, then I would rather you spend the night in jail than to hurt or kill yourself or somebody else out there. Absolutely. That's you know, I agree with you one hundred percent. You know, and it really hurts my heart that the first uh two hundred and eighty four days of two thousand twenty one troopers alone have investigated or have made four hundred and sixty eight death notifications. Mm -hmm. 468 death notifications this year. And contrary to beliefs, mo most crashes are preventable. Mm -hmm. Most cra traffic crashes are preventable. Um, that leads us to believe that there was something that the motor vehicle operator did while operating the vehicle that caused the crash. It's, uh, it's the majority of the time it's going to be operator error. So we're encouraging everyone to just take a few extra moments, uh, make sure that everyone in the vehicle is not just buckled, but properly buckled. Make sure that you abide by the speed limit. You're never operating the, the vehicle over the posted speed limit or faster than you can safely maneuver it. Um, take a few moments to just make sure you're gonna do the right thing. Make sure that your tires are properly inflated. Make sure that all of your vehicle, um, vehicle mechanics are in properly proper work in order. Just, you know, just do your part. Do your part in making sure that you're being a direct extension of us to make sure that everyone's safe. Absolutely. Those are some good points and tips to have. 
Um, and thank you for that. I'm definitely going to make sure I keep that in mind because um, my husband will tell you the tire issue. It's kind of <laughs> up my alley a little bit, but I've been learning, you guys. I'm learning. So, yes. Um, so, these are some really great points, some really impactful stories, some important advice. And I hope that this video was informative. I hope that you in this video feeling more knowledgeable um, and that you spread the word to all your friends. Be that person that is a good influence, that gives, you know, influences everyone around you to, like Trooper King said, to just do the right thing. Um, so thank you guys once again. Yes. For being a part of Thanks this. Thanks for having us. You're yeah. welcome. And y'all are awesome. And I just want to not only thank you for being on the podcast, but just for what y'all do every day. Um, I feel like, you know, especially these days, law enforcement doesn't get enough credit for what they do. And y'all, y'all are awesome. Thank you. And I have so much respect, thank so you. much respect for y'all. Thank you very much. And um, you you're welcome. Always, always. So here at the Agency for Substance Abuse Prevention, we have our HOPE campaign, Hold On, Pain Ends. If you're going through something right now, if you maybe do have a drinking problem and you have been drinking and driving or just an opioid misuse issue, please feel free to give us a call at 256-831-4436. We will be more than happy to give you more information. We are not um, treatment, but we are prevention, so we can give you those resources that you need to be able to get the treatment, just the help or information that you need, or you can visit us on our website at asaprev.com. Thank you. You know, in terms of seatbelt, a seatbelt is the single most effective tool that the vehicle is equipped with to prevent you from being seriously injured or killed in the event you're involved in a traffic crash. Now, everywhere I go, I always say, it only takes two to three seconds to be, to properly buckle up, two to three seconds. You sit down, you grab the belt, one 1,000, two 1,000, three 1,000, click. It's fairly simple, once again, one 1,000, two 1,000, three 1,000, click. Now, here's the other side to that. If you're involved in a traffic crash and you're not wearing a seatbelt, it only takes two to three seconds to be violently killed. Because contrary to beliefs, people don't just die in traffic crashes, they are violently killed. And going to seatbelt use, mm -hmm. it's not just wearing your seatbelt, it's wearing it proper. That is correct. Mm -hmm. So a lot, a, of, a lot of people will take that shoulder strap and they'll throw it behind their back. That's correct. You can still get a ticket for getting for no seatbelt by wearing it improperly that, that way because that's still gonna lunge you forward Absolutely. and you're gonna end up having a head injury mm -hmm. if, uh, if the only thing that's preventing you from getting thrown out is that lap belt. That is correct. The state law actually requires you to wear that seat belt properly. properly. Okay. It requires you to wear it properly. Absolutely. That's very important, you guys. Three seconds. Yep. That's all it takes to save your life. Yes. Um, so even if you feel like it's not important, just wear that seat belt. Um, we did this project in ninth grade. I'll never forget it. How we made like this little toy car and then we had like a little stick figure in it and then we you know did a little seat belt and we did crash tests and every time there was something when they didn't have the seat belt on how just happened just like that how the little stick figure flew out or flew to another part of the car um so just make sure that seat belt is on on properly is very essential to your well-being while driving the car you can probably find videos of our rollover simulator That's online. Mm -hmm. We have a an, an individual truck bed that we will put a uh, dummy inside the truck bed and it will roll it over and we'll show you how that person gets ejected out of the vehicle without their seatbelt on. Mm -hmm. So you can watch those videos online. Yeah. Very good point. Good. Good. Well, awesome. awesome.